What's up, Eurozones? Welcome to the Eurozone and welcome to, uh, what's this? Another reaction. A re <laughs> I'm just super excited. I'm hyped for this. This is a reaction to the Bobby Dots part two from the Bobby Dots conclusion. This is obviously part two of uh, the Bobby Dots story. So if you haven't read the Bobby Dots part one, then go read that. But as a very, very brief summary, um, essentially we're with Abe. He was kind of homeless before, but he's lying to his mother about it. He was living in the Pizzaplex, uh, and then he got a promotion, and he lives in the Fazplex Tower, which is basically next to, or like behind the Pizzaplex or something, and it's where all of the higher-ups are. Um, and we saw that in the Storyteller as well. And in that apartment, there are the Bobby Dots. And what we learn from them is that there are supposedly generation one bobby dots so bobby dots before them that were physical and they are in the ceiling or something like that there was this guy that went missing called landon and uh we don't really know what's happening and there's kind of a mystery of whether or not the bobby dots are like the generation two bobby dots are actually telling the truth or not i'm 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 questioning them i actually don't think they're going to tell the truth that's that's my call i don't think they're telling the truth i think there's more to it than that i think there's more to landon as well i have no idea who landon might be or how he might play into the story but he could be possessing one of the bobby dots i don't know we need to see where this goes this could be a massive lore drop or or just a massive story in general i have a great feeling about it so the bobby dots conclusion the bobby dots part two also, I'm wearing a suit, not because this is a good story, but because I just came from work. Anyway, <laughs> I saw a, a few people comment that last time, like, he's wearing a suit in a FNAF video. Anyway, Abe should have been happy with his recent promotion at the Mega Pizza Plex that had allowed him to live at the Fazplex Tower, but he'd learnt the hard way that the perk was not guaranteed. There had been only one off-limits apartment available tonight um, when it came for him to move in. He tricked his way inside, hacking the system to give him a place to stay. Oh, the story begins with a recap. That's pretty cool, actually. He had the Bobby Dots to take care of him. Olive, Rose, and Gemini, each with a different function, were holograms that took care of his every need. When strange things started happening around the apartment, they blamed it on the Gen 1 Bobby Dots that lived in the ceiling crawl space. The Gen 1s couldn't be turned off and still tried to help, even though they didn't really understand what helping meant. Oh yeah, the Gen 1s are like trying to kill him. But lately, Abe was starting to wonder whether the Gen 1s were really the cause of his misfortunes. Today's forecast, Olive said, shading her green eyes against the glare coming through the window, is for sun. I could have told him that, Rose said, squinting her pink eyes and nibbling on a croissant. Gemini tapped her blue headset. How about some jazzy music to celebrate the weather? I love these characters, by the way. They are so well written. Uh, frenetic notes of Dixie-style jazz filled the apartment. The music was giving Abe a headache. He rubbed his temples. Rose winked into view. Are you okay? Do you have a headache? No, Abe snapped. It's just that... He stopped. He couldn't afford to anger the Bobby Dots. He forced a smile. Everything's fine. Olive popped up on the screen next to Rose. You're acting strange, she said. Her green eyes closed to near slits as she studied him. Did she know he no longer trusted the Bobby Dots? Abe looked at Rose. Was she watching him just a little too intently? It's just work stuff, Abe said. He tried to open his bedroom door. It wouldn't budge. What's going on? He snapped. Oh, I, initi I initiated the bedroom door lock for your protection, Olive said. Uh, thanks, Abe said. Can you unlock it now? She unlocked it for him, and he's immediately going to work without saying goodbye. Abe had decided that the first thing he needed to do was find out once and for all whether the Gen 1s actually existed. Were they real or a convenient scapegoat for his Bobby Dot's antics? Yeah, the thing is, like, what are the Bobby Dot's motivations if, um, like, are they just, are they just killing people? Like, I need, I need to know more about the Bobby Dot's themselves and why they're doing what they're doing if they are doing something. If the Gen 1s were real, Abe figured there had to be information about them somewhere in the Pizzaplex databases. It was time for him to use his engineering access. Ooh. His screen displayed a list of all the Fazbear Entertainment robots. Abe scrolled through the list. He couldn't find any reference to Gen 1s. Okay, so they didn't exist. Or did they? Fazbear Entertainment didn't always keep records of animatronic failures. <laughs> uh, it was still possible that the Gen 1s records had been deleted. Oh... He's looking for their storage locations now on the database. 
the retired and dysfunctional animatronics were kept in the Pizza Plex's underground levels. If the Gen 1s did exist, Abe might be able to find one in storage. It was worth a try. Abe took the elevator to the first level of the underground. From here to get to the lower levels, you have to follow descending tunnels. It's the loading dock or storage area. That's really cool. The first level wasn't so bad. The official storage floor for the Pizza Plex was just a big warehouse. It had concrete block walls and a shiny cement floor. Metal shelves held thousands of boxes and crates lined the walls. Uh, Abe walked on, heading to the dingy opening to the Utilidors. The Utilidor was a dark passage with a metal grate floor. Abe's feet created a metallic cadence that echoed around him as he strode as fast as he could between runaway uh, runway like rows of red lights that lined the metal gridwork. Above, more red lights barely illuminated the long cramped hallway. The lights threw their red glow over a network of wires and pipes lining concrete walls. This section of the pizza plex was like its circulatory system. All the complex's utility lines originated here. This area gave the pizza plex its life. The utilidors were musty. Abe reached the end of the utilidors. Now for the worst part, this was the sewers. <gasps> Oh, I love how connected to security breach this is, it's great. It was a graveyard of damaged and discarded animatronics that were no longer deemed useful. The Pizza Plex couldn't afford a friendlier robot dumping yard, so they decided to use the sewers. Oh, Jesus. Oh, that's that explains a lot. <laughs> this was where the old and useless were left to languish. Or well, anguish? I don't know. I don't I don't know if a word languish exists. Um whereas the storage level was kept clean and was brightly lit, the, this floor was a little more than an indoor landfill and it was infested with wandering, wasted animatronics. Um, so I guess um, this is where the old Glamrock Chica ended up. Abe sucked in his breath when his flashlight's beam landed on one such animatronic, the pitiful remains of a Glamrock Chica resting against the sewer's outer wall. She's still alive but trapped in the sewer canal wall. She's missing her lower part of her face. He just leaves her there because she, he's spooked. Abe hurried past, trying to ignore the way Chica's head turned to follow his movement. What? What? I'm... I'm a bit confused at that. Uh, so there are multiple Glamrock Chicas, I guess? Like, I don't... I'm a bit confused. I do remember there seems to be, like, a Chica area in the sewers. Um, right after when you... You take... Chica to the sewers, um, you know, or the trash compactor, through the trash compactor. Um, I believe there's like a spot with like Chica merch and stuff. So Chica's very like connected to that area, it's weird. Anyway, A practically ran through the sewer, dodging past a small army of wandering endoskeletons and mutilated animatronics. Is he gonna see the staff bots? Please, 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 I wanna see the staff bots. Then Nightmare on staff bots? As far as Abe knew, no human had ever been hurt by the roaming robots, but he wasn't taking any chances. Abe searched the underground until well after midnight. Oh wait, the the staff bots don't even exist by by now. Um, there's no staff. Great attention to detail right there. I love that. Um, they've really thought this story through. He wasn't taking any chances. Abe searched the underground until well after midnight. By then he was in a jangle of edgy nerves. He was hot, he was dirty, and he was discouraged. Um, it was time to give up. Abe was almost at the end of a corridor when his flashlight beam landed on a purple hippopotamus. <laughs> what? It was Mr. Hippo. Of all the animatronics, Mr. Hippo was his favourite. Of course, of course. Um, Abe thought of the hippo as a sort of grandfatherly figure. Oh, Mr. Hippo, he's dead. I'm so confused. Is this Glamrock Mr. Hippo or Mr. Glamrock Hippo? <laughs> Mr. Glamrock Hippo. Um, so that would mean that Mr. Glamrock Hippo... I, Glamrock Mr. Hippo did actually exist. That would be weird. Is he a Glamrock version? I don't know. Abe studied the unmoving hippo before him. Mr. Hippo was supposed to have blue eyes and four teeth on his bottom jaw. He also supposed to have a black top hat. This Mr. Hippo's eyes were missing. So were two of his teeth in his hat. He did, however, still have a flower and buttons on his chest. Abe reached out and patted Mr. Hippo's shoulder. I guess it's not the Glamrock version then. I guess it's just there from the pizza place fire. Hmm? I guess. I guess, right? 
That's the only other place I can think of it like coming from. Mr. Hippo didn't move. Abe started to turn away, but he stopped when his gaze landed on a hint of purple on the floor a few feet from Mr. Hippo. Abe bent over and picked up a Mr. Hippo magnet. <laughs> I remember these, Abe whispered. Mr. Hippo magnets were novelty toys that had been recalled several years before. The magnets, Abe remembered, were so strong that they'd shorted out electronics. Bravo, Cawthon. Honestly, I love how everything is connecting back. The magnet could probably be strong enough to disable the locks in his apartment. He could use it to get out of his ba uh, bedroom at night and find out what the Bobby Dots were doing. He could no longer rely on them to open doors and he didn't want to tip them off his to his plans. Saving that. Bravo, Cawthon. Uh, Abe pocketed the magnet. It was time to go back to his apartment and get to the truth. Transition skipped to his apartment. He's getting ready for night time and so am I. <laughs> Lamau. Uh, I said Lamau out loud. Rose and the other two Bobby Dots hovered on the glass panel above the head of the bed. Rose watched Abe with her big pink eyes. Abe looked at all the Bobby Dots in turn. Good night, she said. The Bobby Dots gazed at him unhappily. Did they feel sad for him? Were they annoyed with him? What were they planning next? Good night, Abe said again. The Bobby Dots blinked out of view. The alarm woke Abe at 2am. He sat up and looked around. All the screens were dark. So was the apartment. Abe reached under his pillow and pulled out the Mr. Hippo magnet. He gets up out of his bed and puts the magnet on the locked door. Um, it worked. He's now going out into the kitchen and living room where the terminal is so he can see if he can monitor their actions. Abe got as far as the coffee table before he heard the noise. It was the same noise he'd heard so many times during the night. It was a soft swish of movement and it was close. Too close. Abe crouched low, ducking behind the sitting area's partition. He froze and listened. He heard a rustling sound and a scrape. Slowly, he leaned forward and peered around the partition. His gaze followed the direction of the sound. The trapdoor was opening. He wanted to see what was coming through the trapdoor, but he didn't want whatever it was to see him. He risked it. He risked it, sorry, and peered and peeked over. And what he saw nearly made him scream. Long black cables dropped from the open trapdoor and trailed through the apartment. The cables looked like tentacles as if a giant black squid was slithering down from the ceiling to find Abe. Oh no. <laughs> I hate squids. I have a massive fear of squids. Um, several rubbery ca- you, Do you guys remember Club Penguin? The Club Penguin squid was nightmare. Um, several rubbery cables twitched Abe's way. They were seemingly alive. Oh no. Uh, Abe scrambled backwards, seeking the shelter of his sofa. The cables pursued Abe, writhing and twitching. They made cracking, rustling noises as they flicked against one another. Cables are crawling the walls of his apartment everywhere. Oh my god, this is horrifying! Abe crawled around the end of the sofa, ducking behind it just in time. Another mass of cables trailed over the coffee table and spread up onto the sofa just as Abe dove behind it. One of the cables flipped over the top edge of the sofa just a few inches from Abe's face. Up close, it was clear that the black cord wasn't a snake or a tentacle. It was an electrical cable. I mean, obviously. Um, I'm going to call it right now. Here's my theory. I think that the Bobby Dots, so the actual digital Bobby Dots, are in control of the physical Bobby Dots. I think it's kind of like a glitch trap kind of situation. A little bit. Sort of like that. But they, they probably have control of the original Bobby Dots, if they even are the original Bobby Dots. They're probably just their actual robot bodies. Uh, they have control of those robots, and they are doing stuff while um, Abe is sleeping. Just like in To Be Beautiful, kind of. Uh, and it, the question is, like, what are they doing? Like, what's their motivation for doing that? Are they trying to kill him? Are they trying to... I don't know. I don't know what else they could be trying to do. But I have a feeling that the digital ones are in control of the physical ones. Uh, and that's why we never see them, like, in the same place at the same time, you know? I, I have a feeling that's probably going to end up right. I don't know where else this might go. But you never know. Could be a massive twist. Um, but it didn't act like any electrical cable he'd seen. It quivered and pulsed with a life of its own. Abe twisted away and looked away, away from it and looked up at the ceiling. A mass of the writhing cables hung down through the trapdoor opening and were descending. Abe, du du Abe ducked behind the couch and hid. His bobby knots weren't lying. The Gen 1s were real. That was a horrifying scene. 
That was horrifying. Abe struggled to accept what was happening. There was an old robot sneaking around Abe's apartment and it wanted to kill him. Um, Abe scooted around his easy chair. He looked toward the main terminal he wanted to access. He wouldn't be accessing the terminal tonight. A Gen 1 was at the terminal. The Gen 1 was clearly a precursor to his Bobby Dots. This one seemed to have been the precursor to Rose. With an abundantly... <laughs> I'm joking. I mean, a and Tom's joking. She is so disgusting looking that Abe cannot bring himself to call it Rose and instead calls it Three. Oh, that's a good way to write the story. Well done. <laughs> Bravo, Cawthon. Um, that's going to be the quote of today. Uh, the top of Three's face and one of her eyes were missing, exposing blackened metal beneath the smooth plastic surface. Her exoskeleton was cracked, revealing parts of her metal ribcage. The rest of her exoskeleton mirrored Rose's feminine form, except for an open midsection that revealed black wires and servos. Instead of Rose's pig, uh, pink pigtails, Three's hair was made of black plastic-covered power cables that cascaded from her skull like a tangle of wriggling snakes. I was just about to say, it's, it's very Medusa-like. It reminds him of Medusa. There we go. <laughs> oh my god. Like, Medusa is horrifying. Th this, this story has already, like, covered a lot of my biggest fears. Snakes? Like, Medusa? Like, <laughs> these weird, this weird hair that's, like, alive? Uh, and squids, <laughs> I guess, and robots. I'm I'm kind of scared of robots. Not gonna lie. Um, whereas the Gen 2's, whereas the Gen 2 Bobby Dots' color designations were prominent, outlining their clothing and filling their eyes in the stream of light that made up their hair, the Gen 1's colors were more subtle. Three had one hot pink eye, a hot pink glow from her chest area, and a hot pink light panel on her right thigh and on a power box midway along one of her cables. Three interfaced with the main terminal. He was so mesmerized by the robot that he wasn't prepared when it suddenly turned and started moving toward the sitting area. And it was coming right toward him. But the robot didn't seem to see him. It wasn't reacting to him at all. Um, three turned to the right and moved toward a wall socket. She either didn't care about Abe, which was unlikely, or she couldn't see him. He watched her as she felt around the wall. She couldn't see. Abe exhaled in relief. But he exhaled too loudly. The robot whirled toward Abe and she opened her mouth. Three let out an ear-splitting keen. The keen pierced right through Abe's eardrums and speared his brain. He couldn't help himself. He began screaming too. She charged toward Abe, her cables writhing around her. He managed to get back to his bedroom and he's barricading the door. He picked up his bedside lamp and brandished it like a club. He expected the robot to barge through the barricade. His chest heaved, his whole body shook. Abe waited and nothing happened. Several long seconds passed and Abe heard the scratching, rustling retreat of the cables. The sound retreated from the bedroom door. Then there was a thump, the trap door, clothing, closing, <laughs> clothing. Uh, Abe collapsed onto his bed. He fell back and then curled up on his side. He now knew who his real enemy was. It wasn't the Bobby Dots after all. Nah, 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 this is a red herring. This is a red herring. 100% this is a red herring. There is no freaking way that the Bobby Dots are innocent after that. No way. And the story just writes it off as, oh yeah, we were wrong. Don't worry, the Bobby Dots are completely innocent. They are not. I am telling you, this is wrong. <laughs> this is a red herring, 100%. He then passes out and goes to sleep. It time skips the next night. We have about 19 pages left before being halfway. Oh, really? This seems very short. Well, actually, maybe not. Uh, it's just, good things take no time. I forgot the quote. What's it? Um, y fun, short period. Time flies. There you go. Time flies. Time flies when you're having fun. Before Abe went to bed the next night, he pulled out his laptop to write to his mom, who lived at uh, a facility to treat her long-term degenerative illness. I love how it's recapping it. Honestly, that's really well done. He wrote to her every week and had been lying to her every week for months about the state of his life, except for a brief window of time when things with the Bobby Lots were good. But after weeks of lying, Abe wanted to tell her something true. He needed some comfort that wasn't coming from a holographic creature. He couldn't tell his mom about what he'd seen. He didn't want her to know how scared he was or how much danger he was in. He thought hard for a few seconds, then he stretched out his fingers and started typing. Did you have a good day today, mom? I hope you did. My day wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. I have a problem I need to solve. To be honest, it's stressing me out. But I remember what you always told me about problems. 
If you look at them the right way, there are always opportunities. I'm not sure how what I have to deal with is an opportunity, but I'll do my best to see it that way. I miss you, Mom. I love you, Abe. I have a feeling, hmm, another prediction, because I may as well predict, because we've we've already seen a whole story and like this is the conclusion. I want to predict things so that if I get it right, it'll be like an epic moment. I have a feeling his mom isn't alive or something like that. There's something going on with his mom because we haven't heard his mom reply at all. We haven't heard his mom reply. Is it all in his head? What if the twist is that all of this is in his head? I don't know how that would work. I like, this is really hard to put together because there is a lot going on. There is a lot going on. There's a lot of mystery here and I'm hoping it, it will get cleared up at least. Later that night, Abe tried to do what he had told his mother he was doing. What else could he do about the Gen 1s? The only thing Abe could think to do was watch the Gen 1s enough to get an idea of how to stop them. It filled him with dread, but he had to do it. Abe's alarm went off at 2am. He rubbed his eyes, gathering his courage to get out of bed. The Bobby Dots continued to lock Abe in at night. They said it was for his own good and he couldn't argue with them, not after what he'd seen. The Bobby Dots didn't like Abe's attempts to watch the Gen 1s either, so he kept using the Mr. Hippo magnet. As Abe stepped into the sitting area, his skin prickled. There she is, cover girl, let's go. He spotted a Gen 1, it was a blue one. Just as Abe had labelled Rose's counterpart 3, Abe immediately thought of Gemini's blue-eyed counterpart as 1. He hadn't yet seen Olive's counterpart too, and that was okay. Abe pressed back against the wall as one skulked past. Oh, she's blind too. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Uh, one turned to look at him. When it didn't react, he realized three wasn't the only blind Gen 1. One was blind too. Was two blind as well? Again, Abe was in no hurry to find out. As one moved by, Abe studied her. One was missing an arm and the lower part of her face covering, which exposed a blackened metal tooth-filled mouth and jaw. There we go. There's the bobby dot. Her remaining arm was missing its white endoskeleton below the forearm, so her remaining hand was nothing but battered, inky metal. She has a ponytail, apparently. That's cool. One's cables, unlike three, emanated from the crown of her head like a top-knot ponytail. Both of one's eyes shone blue and she had a glowing blue oval on her forehead similar to one of those of the Gen 2 Bobby Dots. He hadn't heard three speak, but one's voice box appeared to be damaged. It was emitting hissing and gurgling sounds. The sounds were soft, but they were unnerving. Abe shifted his attention to the cables now. He recoiled from the convulsive flow of the black cables that moved along with one. Looking at the black tail-like things streaming behind one, Abe felt like his apartment had been transformed into a nest of vipers. As the cables twitched near him, Abe shrank back as if a single touch of their twitching ends could kill him instantly. She's just walking around and scanning the room. Uh, she's walking slowly and limping into the kitchen. He leaned forward to study her movement. She didn't seem to be doing anything except feeling the counter and cabinet surfaces. It almost seemed like she was looking for something. Abe sidled through the sitting area to get closer to the kitchen. Unfortunately, he wasn't as careful as he should have been and as he passed an end table, his leg brushed against it and the table shifted, jostling its lamp. The lamp didn't make much noise as it wobbled slightly, just a little rattle, but the noise was enough to get one's attention. One stopped, her head then slowly rotated towards Abe. He froze. She's just staring at him. She was staring directly at him. He held his breath. Her servos clicking, one turned away from the kitchen. He's assuming she didn't hear him enough and is continuing to move on. She took two ponderous steps toward the sitting area. The black cables throbbed and surged. The rubbery cords were only a couple of feet from Abe's legs. He stared at them and swallowed hard, leaning backward. Um, one took another step. She was so close that Abe could see each scorched, barren metal tooth in her flayed open jaw. The glowing light from her beaming blue eyes fell across Abe's face. Also, what the fuck, scorched? Are you alright? What the... What? You're all right. Oh, scorched. Wait. Scorched. Okay, got you, got you. So th I'm assuming at this point, chat was saying, scorched, oh my God, oh my God. They were doing like the, that emoji that's like, um, and I think that's because they're talking about like, it means they've probably been in a fire. No, 
I, I'm probably wrong, because that sounds like a massive stretch. <laughs> Honestly. Uh, each scorched, barren metal tooth in a flayed open jaw. I, I don't think that means she's been in a fire. I mean, what's that going to imply? What, the, the Bobby Dots were around doing FNAF 6? They could be mimics. No, they can't. No, no way. That's that's a terrible idea. Hmm. No, that no, they're not mimics. <laughs> they could be. What could they be? I I really I hope that they are. I hope this is a big reveal. Like I really hope there's a massive reveal somewhere in here. If this ends on like a cliffhanger, I'm gonna be so upset. Um, one was so close, too close. Abe couldn't believe he'd let himself get cornered like this. Abe couldn't hold his breath any longer. He opened his mouth and exhaled as quietly as he could. One lunged toward Abe, her bare metal hand hinging open, seeking something to grab. Abe had no choice. He had to move. With a low hum, her head rotated left and right as she sought him. She reached her single arm out and swept the air around her, feeling for him. He's running into his office and hiding under the desk. He tried to calm his staccato breathing as he ignored the sweat that wormed its way down the back of his neck. He waits a couple of minutes and hears nothing. Abe wasn't sure how long he waited. It felt like hours. His head ached with the effort of trying to listen. But he no longer heard anything. Nothing. No whispers or rustles. No taps or clicks. Abe reached out a trembling hand and gripped the cold metal of the office door's handle. He held his breath and pushed it down. He paused, then pulled the door open until he could just peer through the resulting crack and see into the kitchen. He looked at the shadows mottling the table and the counters. The area was clear. Then he looked up. A tangle of cables still dangled from the open trapdoor. One was still down here, somewhere. Abe started to close the office door again. Before he could, the cables began to shift, slackening. For some reason, his office doesn't have a locking mechanism, so he's trying to think of other options. He really just had one option. He had to try to get to his bedroom. He can't tell where one is because there's cables everywhere in the apartment. He can only make guesses based on the direction of them. She's seemingly in the living room based on where the cords are directed toward. Abe stepped out of the office and tiptoed through the kitchen. If he could get to the, uh, around the fridge, it was a straight shot to the bedroom. He moved out away from the fridge and he nearly walked right into the one. One gazed directly at Abe, her toothy mouth clenched in a metal grimace. The lights in her eyes pulsed. The metal tooth filled mouth opened. Abe looked into a darkened moor. I should get some water. I can't because Five Nights at Freddy's will be at the fridge. <laughs> So random. So random. Who, who sent this? It's not a gif. Oh. Um, a was in motion instantly. He lunged away from one, taking a long step toward the, be uh, the bedroom. Unfortunately, he didn't complete the step. <gasps> he died? Uh, one's hand clamped tightly around his ankle and tugged. Abe crashed to the floor. His head grazed the coffee table on his way down and pain shot through his temple. He landed on his stomach and the air was knocked out of him with a grunt. Um... The, the Gen 1 stumps shake the whole apartment. The apartment floor quaked as one leaped toward Abe, her heavy foot landing next to his head. Abe rolled to the left. He managed to avoid her outstretched arm. At least this meant his leg was free. Unfortunately, he couldn't avoid the cables. They're wrapping around him now. They were everywhere and they snapped into frenzied motion, whipping through the air and hitting Abe's bare arms and neck. His skin was abraded and sliced, even flayed in places where wires had broken through the protective cabling. Abe rolled, trying to free himself from the writhing cables. Soon he was on his feet, staggering. He tore around the back of the sofa, and that's when he discovered one wasn't the only Gen 1 that had come down at the crawl space tonight. No! <laughs> oh my god, this is actually terrifying. I, I genuinely feel tense. Like, tension. Um, as Abe rounded the back of his sofa, his ankle was once again ensnared by the tight grip of powerful sharp metal fingers. Abe screamed, and it was Two who replied with screams of her own. When she screamed, her broken lower jaw creaked and flopped to the side. Abe shuddered as he looked into the blackness beyond her metal teeth. If one and three were damaged, Two was ravaged. <laughs> her shell is completely removed. She was just a stripped down metal endoskeleton topped by a mutilated one-eyed skull. Even her cables were laid bare. Copper wiring sprouted from the top of her mangled cranium. Um, that too was nothing but a stark metal torso and skull streaming, uh, skull streaming exposed wires. Two's hip sockets were ragged as both limbs had been torn away. 
The only way two could move, obviously, was to drag herself along by her arms. I Sorry if I, that took me a w little while to read, but I was just thinking something in my head when Entom said um, everyone th that everyone that said she'd be like Monty. Oh, yeah. Um, Entom is saying, like, it's a little bit like Monty because it doesn't have legs. Then I, then I thought to myself, like, Rose, Olive, or one, two, three, as the physical Bobby Dots, could they somehow parallel the the ruined versions of the Glam Rocks? Um, because they're blind, like Roxy doesn't have her eyes, uh, one of them doesn't have legs, uh, and one of them doesn't have mouth. Ooh. Ooh! Huh. And we know that the Bobby Dots is paralleling a lot of what Gregory went through. You know how, um, like, he went into the, uh, the West Arcade and went into the bathroom, came out, and DJ Music Man's hand came through and stuff, just like how it happens in the games. Like, a lot of this is paralleling what happens in the games. Uh, this is interesting. This is very interesting. Okay. Two was able to do uh, that amazingly quickly, her movement spider-like. As she squirmed closer to Abe now, her exposed wires sparked around her. One of the sparks landed on Abe's calf. He yelped. Um, two yelped as well. She tightened her hold on him. Red hot pain shot up through Abe's ankle. He was scared his bones would end up being crushed. His adrenaline gave him strength. Abe kicked out hard and wrenched his foot free from Two's grasp. He winced. He got up and turned, once again. He was face to face with one. Abe paused, which caused Two to grope her way up to his legs again. She clamped her hand around his thigh. Abe bellowed. Warmth flowed down his leg. Blood? Uh, <laughs> duh. Uh, Abe turned his head. One reached her only arm up toward him and clawed. She wasn't stopping. This was it, he thought. They were going to kill him. Suddenly the TV came on. A blonde meteorologist spoke through a news report at blasting volume. The sound was deafening, and it caused two to recoil. Both robots began to cover their auditory senses. Why are you celebrating? This is a horrible story. <laughs> uh, Abe took advantage of the distraction. The distraction, however, didn't last long. It was because one yanked the TV off the wall. Oh my gosh. One launched toward the flat screen, yanked it off the wall, and slammed it onto the coffee table. Glass shattered everywhere. The glass erupted like shrapnels. Abe tried to cull himself up into a ball, but it was too late. Abe could begin to feel the little slices all over his body. Ah! Oh, despite the pain biting, he went through it. He told himself he could survive this if he got to the bedroom. They can't see, so they're looking around in circles. Abe looked at the glass screens, as he hopes they would. The Bobby Dot's faces appeared on screen, their hands on their faces, all three watching Abe and Gen 1's in horror. Abe pointed at Gemini. Music! The speakers! Um... Gemini nodded. Rock music bled the speakers. Let's go, Gemini. Perfect solution. Genuinely. This is so well written. Oh my god. They're still sus, though. They're still sus. This doesn't make up for the susness. One and two screeched in anger. They began ba battling, or oh, sorry, batting their heads as if trying to destroy their auditory senses. Um, two, screaming, began crawling up the wall, digging her fingers into the drywall. She was trying to reach the speakers. Abe stood and one began batting. She cocked her head and looked directly at Abe. Abe ran across the glass-covered floor and barged into his room, barricading the door behind him with his dresser. He added a chest against the dresser for safe measures. Yeah, world's smartest Pranaf Protag. Honestly. Honestly, yeah. Um, he then let his legs give out and he sank to the floor. The Bobby Dots appeared on the screen in front of him. He told Gemini to turn the music off and she did. The apartment is now quiet and still. I recommend you wrap your wounds, Olive said. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> All right, fantastic. This is great. That's cool. That's that's cool art. What's that for though? I don't know what that's for. Um, the White House is sad to announce the Bobby Dots will conclude in five days. Uh, three days, two days, one day. Jobby Dots, fantastic. Oh boy, I'm so excited for the Bob. Um, <laughs> Juan. Okay. Bobby Dot's conclusion, part two, part two, yeah. You'll need a lot of gauze, Rose said. 
Abe exhaled and sat up wincing. Abe um, used the bed to let to heft himself to his feet and stumbled into the bathroom. He looked in the mirror. It was worse than he thought. He looked like he was straight out of a horror movie. Every inch of his exposed arms was sliced and scraped. His face was cut up, cuts, split his chin, dissected his cheeks and scored his forehead. One gouge, he realised, had narrowly missed his left eye. Damn. Shallow horizontal slashes bisected at Abe's neck. One of them was perilously close to his jugular. Um, blood flowed down from his neck, soaking, soaking his t-shirt. The material, which had been pale blue when he pulled on the t-shirt, was now a shiny dark red. Jesus. It was cut into ribbons as well. His chest and stomach were lacerated. Most of the cuts were as shallow as the ones on his neck. He needed to go to the hospital, but how would he explain his injuries? What if the hospital contacted the police? If Abe went... Uh, God, what's, uh... If Abe went for help, his entire ruse would fall apart. Technically, he was allowed an apartment by his job, but this one was off-limits for a very good reason. True. Fazcorp name drop was here, it seems. Fazbear Corporate cracked down on rule violations. Would he lose his job? Would they press charges? What if he ended up in jail? Abe gripped the edge of the bathroom sink, but his legs gave way. He sank to the floor. Weakly, Abe reached the under the cabinet under the sink or into the cabinet under the sink sorry he groped for gauze and bandages starting with his worst wounds first he began trying to patch himself up he is crying he was crying after a few minutes and keening in uh, pain after a few more he was spent when he finally finished wrapping all his wounds how much more of this could he take time skip to the next day he's at work he can barely walk without it being painful and his co-workers are calling him a mummy he couldn't blame anyone for commenting on his appearance. His arms and hands and neck were wrapped in gauze and, his band and he had bandages all over his face. Rodin had called him an idiot for his smooth move of coming into work like that nonchalantly. Abe couldn't then argue. He was an idiot. He was such an idiot. He'd hacked himself into a lethal apartment. Or lethal apartment. And he was stuck there. Um, he's continuing on with his work day, moping while in pain and waiting for his next work order. Monty's Gator Golf was packed. Let's go, Monty's Gator Golf. The whole of Gator Golf was neon green and decorated with palm trees and ponds. A holographic Montgomery Gator moved through the course during his performance. The <laughs> catwalks. The Gator Golf area wasn't just an 18-hole miniature golf course. It was also a play area. It had a golf ball-themed carousel in addition to the ball pit and catwalk. True. Uh, most of the golf course's holes were either jungle or gator inspired, but the fifth hole featured a rotating birthday cake that dripped with folks uh, chocolate frosting. The ball was supposed to be hit through a gap in the cake when it rotated just to the point, uh, just to the right point in its revolution. According to Abe's work order, the cake wasn't turning. Uh, there was a bastard child hitting the cake with a golf club. It's a girl, it's not Gregory. <laughs> I love how people immediately thought it was Gregory. Abe navigated through the course until he reached the cake. There, he chastised a little girl who was pounding on the cake with a golf club. Stop, Abe told, told the curly-haired rascal. It's broken. Yeah, well, pounding on it isn't going to fix it. <laughs> that is an LOL moment. That's what my daddy does to his computer when it doesn't work, the girl said. Please go stand over there, Abe said with extreme patience. I'll fix this in no time. He's going to fix the cake, but it hurts to move, so he's going slow. My grandpa moves faster than you, <laughs> the girl said. He opened his toolbox slowly. Good for him. How come you look like a mummy? The girl asked. The girl has no chill. I love this. This is great. How do you know I'm not a mummy? Abe asked as he poked the mechanism. Mummies don't talk. They groan. Abe let out a long groan. The girl giggled. You're funny. Thank you. I'll fix this in no time. The girl lifted up her golf club. <laughs> Lamau? <laughs> Abe looked at the girl. If you hit the machine again, I will send Montgomery Gator after you. The girl stuck her tongue out at him and backed away, giving him space to fix the machine. <laughs> this story is so comedic. He took 15 minutes to fix the cake on the fifth hole and Abe felt every second. He said goodbye to the little girl, adding another mummy groan that made her giggle again, and went to the atrium to grab a slice of pizza. I just had a really weird thought. And, okay, bear with me. Bear, freaking bear with me, okay? <laughs> this might be an insane theory, 
and probably something that has like no evidence to support it. It's except for the fact that he's a mummy, like a, a mummy. Could the, could Abe be Michael Afton? <laughs> now that would be a reveal. That it that would be a reveal if this entire time Abe is Michael Afton. Uh, after the FNAF 6 fire, he obviously survived. He is living in the pizza plex because he doesn't have a family, but he does have a mother who he's emailing, but she's not alive. Uh, I don't know. I, like, in, that would be a crazy theory. That would be so crazy. Hmm. The only thing is, like, why would he be working at the pizza plex? Oh, uh, I, I really want that to be true, but I don't think it is. He does have Big Bear email. Like, the, uh, in the FNAF AR emails, there is a guy called Michael with the email, like, mafton at bigbearmail.com or something like that. Uh, so, you know, he could be working at the pizza place. I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's just a hypothesis. Um... Uh, it took 15 minutes to fix the cake on the fifth hole and Abe felt every second. He said goodbye to the little girl, adding another mummy groan that made her giggle again and went to the atrium to grab a slice of pizza. He finishes the pizza and realises he has a little bit left to sit until he's off break and he's having trauma flashbacks over the Gen 1s attacking him. Understandable, honestly. He goes to Rockstar Row and sees the happy families. Rockstar Row was a museum-like area that celebrated Fazbear Entertainment's animatronics, filled with neon-wrapped display cases that showcased both old and new versions of the popular robots. The gallery also had golden statues of all the glamrock characters and green rooms for each of the lead animatronics. Abe paused in front of Roxy's green room and stared at the ties and racing flags that decorated the walls. It reminded him of his old hut, of his old hut in Roxy Raceway. They're all kind of full of themselves, aren't they? A young woman's voice asked. Abe blinked and turned to see a petite, brown-haired girl with an almost impish face standing next to him. She flashed a pretty smile and winked. Her eyes were a startling violet blue. Who are? Abe asked. The woman pointed at the life-size drawing of Roxy holding her keytar. The animatronics. They exude confidence. I suppose they do. Is that a bad thing? Abe asked. Maybe. Maybe not. I haven't decided. That's why I'm here to decide whether or not the animatronics are too confident. The girl laughed. He liked her laugh. Bisexual flag moment. <laughs> um, that's so cute. Oh my god, I love that Abe design. I love that Abe design. I mean, I love the Bobby Dots design, but that's beautiful. Puppy. Puppy. <laughs> um, although the crowds were thick around him and the woman, and the music and laughter were relentless, uh, Abe felt like he'd stepped into a bubble. The woman seemed to push reality away from him, even his pain diminished. The woman stuck out a small square hand with neatly trimmed, unpainted nails. I'm Sha I'm Sasha, not Shasha. I'm Abe. Nice to meet you, Abe. Would you like to walk with me? She's walking around Rockstar Row with him now, looking at the green rooms and explaining why she's here, and it's interesting, I guess. Very interesting. I'm a social worker, Sasha said. I work with troubled kids. One of my co-workers wants to bring some of our kids here for an outing, and I'm not sure it's a great idea. Don't get me wrong, I love the pizza plex and all things Fazbear. I'm a Freddy fangirl. I'm not ashamed to admit it. But when I started thinking about the animatronics and how they'd come across to kids with, well, issues, I wasn't sure this is the best place to bring them. Oh! I've sussed it. The Glamrock's personality chips are Bobby Dots. They're full of themselves. They are freaking full of themselves. There is a parallel right there with the original Gen 1 animatronics or the Gen 1 Bobby Dots. There is a parallel with them and the scrapped um, Glamrocks. There are parallels here, up, down, left, right, mid, center, off the side. <laughs> uh, there's parallels everywhere. Come on. You gotta admit it. You, got <laughs> you have to admit it. I don't know. I feel like like we've always wondered about what how we've always wondered about how their personalities are so lifelike right how they are so human like and this is probably the answer bobby dots hmm 
Sasha looked at Abe's Peterplex uniform shirt. You work here. What do you think? Honestly? Abe said. What would be the point of anything else? Okay, well, I think the Peterplex is a great place for kids. To a point. The games are fun. The food's good. Kids love it here. But if I was a dad, Abe paused. Go on, Sasha said. I wouldn't leave my kids unattended, and I'd make sure they didn't spend too much time with the animatronics. The robots are fun, but they're a little over the top, Sasha supplied. Okay, so apparently this wasn't the scene I, I saw that talked about their sentience, but it's similar. I don't recognise all of this. There's a second scene later on. Okay. They continue walking and talking. It eventually derails into personal questions. What games do you like? Sasha asked. I'm partial to old-fashioned arcade games, Abe said. Sasha grinned. Let's go play. Abe and Sasha managed to pick in, or pack in two games of skee-ball and three games of pinball. The whole time they laughed and joked, Abe was smitten. Abe is so awkward, he's adorable. Oh, I love Abe. Abe is, Abe is my soul character. <laughs> my soulmate. There we go. Uh, Abe suddenly blurted out, Would you like to come to dinner with me tonight? Oh. <laughs> oh. Um, sure. Not here, Abe said. Oh yeah, no, obviously not. It's giving the Silver Eyes vibes. True. Abe named a Chinese restaurant not far from the pizza plex. He's baffled at how she did not acknowledge his bandages at all. I'll meet you there. Sasha said. Seven? Abe nodded. Sasha disappeared into the crowd. The Golden Garden was a high-end Chinese restaurant. Abe wouldn't have been able to afford this before he got to his, his promotion. The truth was, he could barely afford it now, but he wanted to take Sasha someplace nice. They get seated and Abe lists food options to Sasha. That's all perfect, Sasha said. I don't eat beef. Neither do I anymore. Olive won't let me, Abe said. Olive? Abe winced. Why had he said that? Oh no! <gasps> this story is great. He decided to ignore the question. Why do you like the pizza flex so much? He asked. De deflection. Okay, I'll let you get away with it. For now. Sasha gave Abe one of her delightful winks. So he's, he's going to bring her to his place, right? 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 <laughs> That's going to happen, right? She's going to learn about them and she's going to have something to say. I don't know. They're going to connect that it's that the Bobby Dots are the Glamrocks. I'm, I'm sure. Haha, <laughs> thanks. Um, no problem. I like the Pizza Plex and the whole Fazbear franchise just because of the juxtaposition of the fun and mystery. I've read about all the, all, all the lore of the old locations, the scandals, the rumours. I'm a big mystery fan. Uh, me too, Sasha beamed. I knew I liked you. Abe flushed. Aww. Uh, but I also love fun, Sasha went on. Fazbear Entertainment is a crazy mix of the two. The waiter brought their egg rolls. For the next half hour, Abe and Sasha focused on their food and bantered about Freddy Fazbear. <laughs> That's all I ever do. <laughs> um, fortune cookie time. Sasha opened her fortune cookie. It read, Secrets poison good relationships. Oh, uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> she looked up. Uh oh. You know what that means. We need to circle back to what you said about Olive. Sorry, I can't let you off the hook any longer. You haven't asked me why I'm all bandaged up, he said. I figured you'd tell me if you wanted to, she smirked. Abe hesitated. Then he blurted. I live in the Fazplex Tower. Or, yeah, fa yeah, Fazplex Tower. You said that wrong, Enton. Olive is one of the holographic helpers in my apartment. Um, Sasha leaned forward. Her eyes sparkled. Really? I've heard stories about the high-tech stuff in those apartments. Oh, you have to invite me to your place, she finished. I, uh, I love them. I... Instantly, I love Sasha and I love their relationship. It's going so well. People thought uh, Abe was like Aero uh, before this, but I don't know. Uh, maybe. He seems very kind of like to himself. Um, if you don't, I'll scream. But yeah, he, he, I, I feel like he's like a very big... Um... I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean. Abe widened his eyes and Sasha laughed. Not really. Or, yeah, maybe. Screaming works for the kids at work sometimes. She laughed again. Abe tried to imagine Sasha in his apartment. What would she think of the Bobby Dots? What would they think of her? He thought about the shattered TV and coffee table in his living room. Having Sasha over would be a very bad idea. Sasha pressed her hands together, tilted her head and battered her eyelashes. Pretty please. Oh, I love Sasha. <laughs> He's a god. He's going to invite her over, but on another night so he can clean and cook for her. Sasha's happy and he is too. He realises he's going to have to deal with the gem ones as well, so he's thinking of a plan. Time skipped to a few days later. Bro borrowed some supplies from the Pizzaplex maintenance department. Smart man. 
He looked up at the trapdoor on the ceiling, then he set his tools on the kitchen table. Nice! Oh my gosh! Abe is actually so smart. He's the smartest protagonist we've ever had in these books. Apart from maybe Luca. He got like everything right about the Fazbear Law. Um, he dragged the table across the floor and positioned it under the trapdoor. The nearest screen lit up and the bobby dots popped into view. Are we rearranging the furniture? Rose asked. Putting the table close to the fridge is a wonderful idea. <laughs> what is that photo? Uh, Abe smiled as he climbed onto the table. Sorry, Rose. This isn't where I'm going to leave the table. He picked up his tools and stood. Is something broken? Olive said. I can provide instructions for repair. Abe shook his head. Thanks, but I've got this. He's going to seal... I've, I've read that as steel for a minute. He's going to seal the trapdoor. Abe felt his heart beat pick up now that they were watching and pulled out a new heavy duty lock hasp from his pocket. He positioned it on the ceiling and marked the spots for its screws. The trapdoor already has a lock, Olive pointed out. One that the Gen 1s can unlock, obviously, Abe said. They won't have the key for this one. Uh, Hi, I'm sorry an octopus invaded my living space. Abe drilled holes into the trapdoor for the hasp he brought and, in and installs it. He looked from the trapdoor to the bobby dots. What do you think? Will that keep the Gen 1s contained? Looks like a very strong lock, Gemini said. Let me guess. The Gem ones are already outside the trapdoor. <laughs> um, that was a very smart thing to do, Olive said. Um, now that you've done that, we can have the special dinner for your girlfriend, Rose said. I love Rose still. Even though I, I still think she's sus, love her. Favourite character ever. What are you fixing? Something yummy, I hope. He's cooking with Rose. This is adorable. I love everything about this story. Abe had decided to make fettuccine Alfredo Ooh, with shrimp. Rose was over the moon. And Caesar salad, she said. You have to make Caesar salad with croutons. <laughs> if Sasha or Abe dies at the end of the story, I'm jumping out my window and opening a portal to hell in my backyard. They are too pure together. I agree. I agree. You must have flowers and candles. All romantic dinners require flowers and candles. Gemini had said the previous evening when Abe had announced the upcoming date. Abe chooses daisies. According to the flower experts, daisies represent innocence, cheerfulness, and new beginnings. When you combine colors, they sim sim uh, when you combine colors, they symbolize sincerity. Hmm. <laughs> he looked around. The kitchen appeared to be safe enough. But what traps might the Gem ones have set during the day before he locked the trap door? Abe shifted his gaze to the Bobby Dots, who hovered on the nearby glass panels. Bobby Dots, I need your help. Um, what? There's a dragon in my room? Huh? <laughs> uh, music. Do you need music? Gemini asked. Actually, maybe. Uh, show off some pop music. Thanks. But what I really need is for all three of you to help me keep Sasha safe. Oh! <laughs> uh, of course we will, Olive said. I appreciate you, Abe said, grinning. His bobby dots giggled. The appreciation issue had become an ongoing joke. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, from yeah, from the first story. Uh, the apartment's intercom buzzed. Abe adjusted his long sleeve, buttoned down shirt. She's here! The shirt Abe chose was one of the shirts Landon, the previous tenant, had left. Abe chose it so he wouldn't scare Sha Sasha with his healing cuts. Abe headed toward the door. When he opened it, he stared. Sasha looked amazing in a fitted, short green dress. She brushed past Abe and turned to look at him. Um, are you expecting someone else? Sasha asked. What? Sasha gestured at the apartment door, which Abe continued to hold open. Abe laughed nervously and let go of the door. It closed with a click. He's so awkward, I love him. It's, he's literally me. He is me. <laughs> um, are you okay? You're looking at me like I've grown horns. Did I? Y you never know. Anything's possible. Uh, Sasha batted her head as if feeling for newly sprouted horns. Nope, no horns. Whisk whiskers? She rubbed her hands over his clear pinkish cheeks. Nope, whiskers free. Sasha winked at Abe. Abe gave her a weak grin. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> she said her friend Meg suggested the dress. Rose suddenly appeared on screen next to them. Are you going to introduce us? Sasha turned toward the sound and looked at the bobby dots who were clustered together on the glass panel at the edge of the sitting area. Sasha smiled and clasped her hands together. Oh hi, aren't you three pretty? <laughs> I love this! Rose giggled. Thanks, so are you. I'm Rose. <laughs> oh, I love this. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. This is an adorable story, but it's also so creepy at the same time. Um... <laughs>
<laughs> Where is this going? Uh, Rose then gestured at her, follow, uh, at her fellow Bobby Knots and turned. This is Gemini and Olive. Very nice to meet you, Sasha said. I'm Sasha. We know, Olive said. He's been talking about you a lot. He's showing her around the place and the Bobby Knots are following along. If you want to redecorate, Olive said, I can research styles and colours to give you options. Oh, that's so cool. It must be wonderful to have a helper like you. Sasha beamed at Olive. And me, Rose said. <laughs> Bobby Knots and Sasha are uh, conversating as Abe cooks now. Sasha, attentive and complimentary, peppered them with questions and showered them with praise. Oh, that looks delicious, Rose said. But are you going to... Are you, yeah, are you sure you made enough for all of us? Sasha looked at Rose, her brow furrowed in puzzlement. Olive must have noticed the expression because she said, Don't mind Rose, she has food illusions. She's convinced she can eat. Sasha smiled at Rose. Well, then you have to join us for dinner. I'm gonna cry! I'm gonna cry! This is my favourite story, it hasn't even finished, there's no twist yet, but... Ah! Uh, nah, -uh, Gemini said. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this is Abe's first romantic dinner. It's supposed to be for the two of us, not for y for us. Uh, sorry, the two of you, not for us. But, Rose began, hush, Olive said. We'll be back later. Gemini and Olive disappeared from the glass screens. Rose remained. Olive suddenly popped back into view and grabbed Rose's arm, then yanked her off the screen. The screen went dark. Sasha looked at Abe and grinned. They're delightful, Abe nodded. Yeah, they're pretty fun. Abe gestured at the table. Have a seat. Wow. Cute, funny, and he cooks. A triple threat. <laughs> You're evil for this, Andrea Wagner or Scott Cawthon, whoever came up with this evil pun. Tr oh! I didn't even notice it. I did not even notice it. A triple threat. That is so evil. Oh, that's amazing. That. This is why this is my favourite story. Well, don't get too excited about me cooking. My mum taught me to make three things. Fettuccine Alfredo, spaghetti marinara, Mariana and tacos. Otherwise, I'm all about the sandwich. Mmm, Italian and Mexican, huh? Pretty much my diet too. Uh, where does your mum live? Is she nearby? Sasha asked. I wish she did. She lives in a care centre nearby. She has dementia. She touched Abe's ha uh, head. Uh, I'm sorry. Or hand, sorry. Not head. I, it could have been either one. I lost my parents. I wish sometimes they could be nearby too. D hmm. Is she really in a care centre nearby? I, st I don't believe it. Like, if she was in a care centre nearby, why wouldn't he go and visit her? Instead of just emailing her. Anyway, they continue to eat and it rails back into happy convos. They're getting along very well and Abe is very happy. W story. And after they ate, the whole evening went well too. They hung out on the sofa and laughed, told stories to each other. Before Sa Sasha left, Abe leaned in and gave her a kiss. Let's go, Abe. Love you. Uh, as soon as Sasha left, he immediately started writing an email to his mom. Hi, mom. Guess what? I met someone. Her name is Sasha. She's smart and fun and pretty. I can't wait for you to meet her. Abe filled several p uh, paragraphs telling his mom about his time with Sasha. By the time he closed his laptop, he couldn't stop smiling. Not even thoughts of the Gen 1s could bring him down. In spite of knowing robots lurked outside his locked room and in spite of the painful cuts of his, he peacefully drifted off into a deep sleep. They're in Bonnie Bowl. <laughs> oh my god. Abe sucks at bowling and Sasha is teasing him and how she's better. So this is your hidden dark side. Gloating when you're wiping out your opponent. Uh, opponent, Abe asks playfully. It was late and Bonnie Bowl was rocking. Most of the 22 lanes were being used and the lines of the ice cream and drinks counter were long. Kids chased one another up and down the white neon lit stairs that separated the snack and service area from the lanes themselves. They also ran up and down the, the along the neon star covered end walls that uh, that flanked the lanes. The white, <laughs> the whole bowling alley was such beldum, or bedlam. Yeah, I don't even know what that word is. Bedlam that Abe couldn't imagine how anyone could concentrate enough to bowl well. We've been going for a while, I know, but uh, oh, hello. <laughs> We've been going for a while, but um, I'm sorry I keep messing up. Uh, no Bonnie reference here. It doesn't even acknowledge Bonnie at all. Ah. Very curious as to why he's being ignored in the series so far. That is true. He is being very annoyed. Like, even... He, like, there haven't been any cameos, really. It's always said, like, the gang are Freddy, uh, Chica, Roxy, Monty. They, they never mention Bonnie at all. Very interesting. Very interesting. Maybe Bonnie doesn't exist. Hmm? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> <laughs> the Gen 1s exist, but Bonnie? Uh. Um, 
Next page or two is then Bowling and Sasha and Abe going to war with the pins. I love how they explore the entire pizza plex in this long story. It's great. He's now taking her away from the plex to go walk to a park so they can have some private space. They are now at the park and he's going to break the ice about it on a date like an idiot. Um, might be like 10 minutes on what they but I was dead, early and expected back. He tells her everything. It doesn't say exactly what he said, just that he does. Now they sat in silence. She was holding his hand. That was a good sign, wasn't it? You think I'm making it up, don't you? She's a W girl. Uh, true. No, not at all. She shifted closer to her, him. I totally believe you. This sounds very sarcastic, by the way. I was afraid that you'd think I was crazy. Any normal person would. I'm not a normal girl, she teased. But that's a story for another day. Oh, Sasha's story? Uh. <laughs> right now, I think I need to figure out what's going on at your apartment. How do you know the Gen 1s really want to kill you? Oh, I love it. Um, I see why the plot included her being a social worker now. Oh no, this is bad. This might be bad. I, I don't know. I, it, it won't be bad. I think Sasha's good. Uh, he showed her his cuts. How do you explain this? Listen, I've worked with kids who suffer from so much trauma that it begins to mess with their actions to other people around them. They act out. It's normal for kids who have been mistreated. They have so much pain inside that they need to let out sometimes. That includes letting it out on other people. I'm thinking this has to do with your previous tenant. Oh, and the gem ones are doing something similar to what mistreated kids do. Um, so I'm reading this. Apparently it's not even that part I saw, but it is. I think you should look into Landon Prout, learn who your previous tenant is. The Gen 1s might have been hurt by him, whoever he was. They might have been acting back that pain on him as well. Um, that stings. Abe tells her he's going to find out more stuff about Landon. Also, do you guys mind? It's a good idea. But until then, I'm not so sure about the love thing yet. I'm growing very fond of you and I want you to be careful. Please sort this out. I would hate to see that padlock fail and you end up chopped into pieces before this can go anywhere. I feel like we're going somewhere. She's cautious, she's cautious on using the term I love you. Okay. Uh, stop talking about your personal life, and Tom. Nobody cares. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, time skip immediately. It didn't take long for the next day for Abe to look through the Peterplex employee database. There he found Landon's file. Here we go. This is what we've been waiting for. Who is Landon? Who the hell is Landon? What happened to him? Landon's file was filled with psychological reports. He was being treated for paranoia. He is patient 46. No, I'm joking. <laughs> paranoia regarding his work at the Pizzaplex. He clicked on a document. Landon exhibits clear signs of delusional paranoid disorder. Landon feel... Oh no! Oh no! No. No, it's all fake. It's all fake. I just got the chills. I got the chills. Oh my god. I think I've sussed it out. So I, I know it probably says it on the screen, like what's happening, but I'm not going to look at it yet. I, I, want, I want it to be like a surprise. I'm sorry this is taking so long, but I, I do want to voice my thoughts because this is an amazing, like a big story in the series. So I, I want to make sure that all of my thoughts come out properly. So my thoughts are that Landon was delusional, right? He had paranoia and he, he, by, by that, I think he means like, uh, he's like imagining all of this. Like he's imagining that he's being attacked and he was fired. I bet he was fired. Okay. Bet he was fired. I bet he was kicked out of the first flex tower. Nothing happened or oh, I don't know. Or maybe he hurt himself or something like that. Okay. Abe. Let's go to Abe. Abe also has a paranoia disorder. Something like that. Okay. That's why he is hearing about these gem ones. Uh, blah, the blah, blah, blah. That's why he's like, okay, you've got to believe me. This is how I got my scars. Uh, but he actually doesn't realize... Like, it, it's dramatic irony. He doesn't actually realise that he is not telling the truth because he doesn't know the truth. He all th he thinks it's all happening uh, in real time. Um, and then, and then, uh, oh yeah, the other thing is that goes back to his mum. 
he still thinks his mum is alive because he's freaking delusional in the head. I, I, halfway through saying that, I realised, like, this is stupid. <laughs> he, he isn't delusional, I don't think. I, I think it's real. But, um, interesting that Landon uh, had paranoid disorder. Okay, he believes the animatronics are stalking him and claim that they will inevitably kill him. Okay. Landon also is believing in outlandish conspiracy theories regarding Fad for Entertainment. It doesn't say what the theories are, but his conspiracy theories are part of accusing him of paranoia in his psychological report. Abe finds nothing else regarding Landon, strangely. No hospitalization notes, no notice of leaving, but he finds a phone number. It's listed under his contact in info. A woman picked up the phone, sounding half asleep, as it was 7.30 a.m. What? I'm sorry for bothering you, but I'm here to trying to speak to Landon. The woman went quiet, and suddenly she began to cry on the other line. Is this a joke? She asked. What? No, not at all, ma'am. I just... Landon's gone. She hung up. Oh, this is getting good. This is getting good. Abe is now trying to investigate stuff more. He metaphorically puts on his thinking cap. Stranger things, real. <laughs> okay, oh, so Sasha is letting him stay over at her place. That's a good idea, Landon. I mean, Abe. Uh, what if, what if Landon is Abe? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, uh, I'm going crazy because this, this is going to be great. This is, it's going to be a massive reveal. I'm sure of it. Um, okay. Sasha had a collection of knickknacks and trinkets on her walls. Um, okay. I did more digging just before I came over here. Abe said as Sasha dig, uh, dished up the fish and chips she'd gotten from a food truck near her building. But I didn't find anything else. So we don't know whether Landon was paranoid because the animatronics were really were out to kill him or not. Sasha said. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you though, Abe said. He felt more sympathy than judgment for Landon after what he'd been through. I think what you found might support my theory, Sasha said. Okay, so how does that help me, Abe asked. She jabbed the air with another fry as she spoke. From what I've heard about the Fazbear Entertainment animatronics, they are programmed to approximate exact human behaviour. This suggests that if, based on be human behaviour, the Gen 1s are acting reasonably to damage Landon, might potentially done to them. Uh, she's comparing this to her statement about the kids that she's worked with and stating that if an, animatronics, uh, if an animatronic were directly programmed to be close to human, they are also acting out similar to that of a child. Basically, that theory is right where they... Uh, is right that they were sentient individuals and not just powered souls. I see, okay. Uh, Sasha pointed her next fry at Abe. I think I should spend the night at your place. Abe choked on his fry. <laughs> he thinks it was a hint. No, it isn't Abe. It isn't, not yet. Sasha laughed. That's not what I meant. She swatted his thigh. I'm not talking romance, idiot. I'm talking research. I want to observe the gem ones for myself. Abe remembered. This morning, his heart had nearly dropped from his chest into his feet when he'd found the hasp on the trapdoor dangling from its hinges. He reluctantly agrees to let her come over so they can both look. I'm not as fragile as I look, Sasha said, winking at Abe. She grinned. There's something behind Sasha as well. I, I really hope we get a story about Sasha because there's something more to her. Like, something has happened to her. She has... She's had something happen to her from Fazbear Entertainment. I know it because the first interaction we ever had with her was her saying, oh, these are a bit too, uh, they're a bit too full of themselves, right? Something happened with her. She hates Fazbear Entertainment. I know it. I didn't think you were. His tension wasn't eased. Nope. We are heading back to your place when we're done eating. Also transition cut. Oh, this is Jesus. Uh, <laughs> Bobby Dot content. The Bobby Dots were very happy that Sasha was spending the night. A sleepover! Rose squealed. We can have snacks. Sleepovers have many benefits, Olive said. They are a great way to experience new things. They help build up independence. They strengthen relationships. They enhance communication skills. And they're fun! Rose growled. <laughs> uh, Abe glanced at Olive. Did Olive narrow her eyes at Sasha just a little? I'll put some music on, Gemini said. How about crackers? Rose said. Or some cheese. What about those little mini tacos in the freezer? Those would be good with some salsa and some... Rose, please. We just had dinner, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we all go back to the bedroom? Sasha said. Abe and the Bobby Dots gave her wide eye legs. <laughs> and talk, I mean. I love this. This is so good. Uh, it was 2am when the Bobby Dots went black. 
Rose blinked out when she heard uh, when she heard foot wasn't on the Ford f foot <laughs> food wasn't on the forecast tonight. Sasha told Gemini to turn the music off, and Olive signed off when Abe told her that her encyclopedic knowledge of bowling wasn't necessarily uh, during that wasn't necessary during Abe and Sasha's discussion of their time at Bonnie Bowl. They were getting nervous. They ended up sitting next to each other, holding hands, just listening. At 2 a.m. or 2.08 a.m., Sasha gripped Abe's hand. Did you hear that? She whispered. He heard the sound. The sound he heard every other night. Ready? He whispered. They're slowly sneaking out now. Sitting at the door, they wait for the swooshing of the cables to move away from the door. It's right outside the bedroom. Remember to be really quiet, he told Sasha. He nodded again. Abe used the Mr. Hippo magnet. <laughs> I love how he's used this picture every single frickin' time. Uh, they snuck quietly toward the sitting area. Abe pointed. Sasha's eyes widened when she saw Two's ghastly torn torso slink over the sofa and head toward the kitchen. I feel like there's going to be a reveal like the one in Loki, where he goes to the timekeepers or whatever they're called, and... He, and Sylvie like throws the axe and it's just like robots. <laughs> I, I would love a reveal like that. Like, <laughs> like Sasha comes to the robot and like takes off the head like Scooby-Doo style and is like, Abe, these are just stupid staff bots or something. <laughs> uh, anyway, Abe pointed again. Sasha turned to watch one and three move around the dining table and split up. One went into the office. Three roamed around the kitchen. Roaming wasn't actually the right word though. Three was moving purposefully as if on a mission. Abe and Sasha stepped close to the panel separating the sitting area from the kitchen. Sasha turned to watch two. Abe watched both Sasha and two. When, Sa when, uh, when two bent over his plug socket, Sasha nudged Abe. She pointed emphatically at the decrepit robot. Abe watched as two pulled out a couple of wires from the socket and disconnected them. Abe um, raised an eyebrow as he noticed that one of the wires, a thin exposed copper wire, ran from the plug to the floor and extended from there along the length of the baseboard toward the apartment door. What was that wire doing there? And why did two disconnect it? Sasha leaned down toward him. I think they're trying to help you, not hurt you, Sasha whispered. Oh man, her whisper is low. Unfortunately, it was not low enough. Oh, were they trying to disconnect the digital bobby dots? Because they're evil? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, her whisper was like, I don't know what's going on with the story anymore, to be fair. Two let out a screech. One and three immediately joined in. All three Gen 1s sprinted towards Sasha and Abe. Abe yelled, run! Because two was between him and the bedroom, Abe ran around the sofa and bolted toward the dining area. He assumed Sasha would be right behind him. When he got to the dining table, he looked back. Sasha hadn't followed him. Oh no. The Gen 1s were still careening towards Sasha, but when they reached her, they didn't touch her. The cables thrashed around them. Three's cables flicked towards Sasha. She leaned back out of its reach. She turned to watch the Gen 1s circle around and head back toward the kitchen. Back toward Abe. They don't care about Sasha. Oh. Oh. Abe thought. They were after him, and only him. Abe turned and ran into the kitchen. The robots kept coming. They surrounded him. Their cables tangled around him like the arms of an enraged octopus. Ugh. He dodged right and left to avoid the cord's biting assault. That is poetic. Abe leaped over Two's scuttling form, or scuttling form, and started to run past the fridge. Just as Three's cables snagged the huge appliance, the fridge fell and toppled toward Abe. They crept closer. Then he screamed and threw up his hands. Abe flailed, batting away the robot's hands and cables. He was out of his head with panic. <laughs> Really? Really? A Fortnite advertisement? Um, oh, he skipped a couple of pages. Oh, no. Oh. Oh, end Tom. <laughs> um, right. Sasha pulled his hand and in a matter of seconds, amazingly, he was free of the robot's cu uh, clutches. Only the tips of their cables swiped at his legs as he teetered after Sasha. Sasha let go of Abe's hand and grabbed his arm. She took most of his weight as she helped him hurry around the sofa and shoot toward the bedroom doorway. Once they were through the door, Sasha slammed it shut. She locked it. Abe shoved the dresser in front of it. Breathless, Abe bent over and panted. Sasha put her hand on his shoulder, catching her breath as well. Finally, Abe straightened. See what I mean? Sasha shook her head. Actually, I don't. Abe gasped at her. Oh, gaped at her. They're not going to hurt you, she said. They're trying to protect you. What? I understand. You're freaked. 
But I want you to think about what you saw in the living room. You saw two disconnect those wires, right? Abe nodded. Yeah, what was she doing? I've never seen that one wire before. The one that led to the door. I think that wire was part of a trap. If it was connected to the plug circuit, the apartment door would have been electrified. It would have killed us if it reached for the door handle. If we'd reached for the door handle, sorry. I think two was undoing a trap, not setting one. Oh no. The reverse, the Una reverse on the bobby dots, Sasha said. Okay, but they tried to get me in the kitchen, she said. Sha Sasha shook her head. They weren't trying to get you. They were trying to help you. But they were literally all over me. Sasha nodded. I know, but remember, we're dealing with damaged robots. They can't function well. I know it felt like they were swim swarming you, but they were actually trying to shield you. I saw the whole thing. I think they were trying to be like bobby bodyguards. Bobby, <laughs> bobby guards surrounding you to keep dangers away. Um, so you know how the bobby dots have access to the control of the entire apartment, right? This includes the ability to re rearrange furniture and appliances as shown. Three pulled it over. No, three tried to stop it when it started falling over. She didn't start it. Oh, there we go. It was the bobby dots, the Gen 2s. I saw it, Abe. I saw the whole thing. They were all around you trying to make, like, I don't know, a fortress around you or something. The fridge started to fall. Three whipped out a cable trying to snag it because she wasn't close enough to grab it. Then they all covered you, and while they covered you, they shoved the fridge so it didn't go all the way over. Abe has a hard time believing it because his only recollection of, his, of it is traumatic. He can only perceive the pain and sensations he felt of the shocks. The fridge didn't fall. If they wanted the fridge to crush you, you'd be crushed. But it didn't fall. It tipped, and they pushed it back. Abe thought about all his encounters with the Gen 1s. Had they really been trying to help him all along? Abe tried to remember what he'd seen the Gen 1s doing before they'd attacked him the first time, if they had really attacked him. Had he just perceived their actions as an attack when it really wasn't? He tried to dissect the memory and figure out what, had, what he'd really experienced. The first time Abe had seen the Gen 1s, he'd expected them to be bad, and he'd been repelled. The creepy cables, the broken, endos the e broken exoskeletons, the missing eyes, the ripped off limbs. The Gen 1s were like robotic undead. They had looked like android villains, so he'd expected them to act like android villains. Abe then realises something. They weren't blind. They only acted as if, as they sensed his fear as a means for defence. This is why one looked right at him and did nothing. His fear warped his mind as perceiving them as evil. They weren't looking around searching to see things. They were searching for traps. Let me guess. The, the Bobby Dots, the original Bobby Dots, are destroyed because of Landon. Because he also thought that they were trying to attack him when they actually weren't. So he attacked them. He might have died from it. And then, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Although that doesn't, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to understand, like, how Landon fits into this. Um, they were searching for traps. I see. He'd completely misinterpreted the broken Gen 1's actions. They weren't murderous. They were really just, because of their damage, clumsy and inefficient. Abe rubbed his face. Okay, so for the, for the sake of the argument, let's say the Gen 1s are protecting me. Who are they protecting me from? The answer's pretty obvious, don't you think? Sasha said. Think, Abe. If it's not the old robots, it's... She looked pointedly at the glass panels that surrounded the bedroom. Abe looked at the glass panels too. He got it. It was the Gen 2s after all. I knew it! I knew it. Um, but my possession theory wasn't correct. The holographic bobby dots ran everything in the apartment and they were never turned off, even when they were dormant. It was obvious to him all along now. He tried to deny it. Now they're deciding they're going to get out of the apartment. They fear the Gen 2s are listening. They were just a few feet from the apartment door when all the apartment lights went out and the glass panels in the apartment activated. <gasps> oh my god. I'm really glad I came back to check that I missed this next part because it's really cool. The bobby dots converged, one on each of the three closest screens. All of them had their mouths open wide in maniacal grins. All of them were brighter than they'd ever been. Their eyes were nearly double in size. Oh my god. Their pigtails gyrated around their heads like angry serpents. Abe couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was the worst betrayal of his life. This is scary, man. This is scary. The doors are locked. They don't know what to do. As soon as they'd realised they were trapped, Abe and Sasha had looked around. What could they do? Going out the window wasn't an option. Shouting for help wouldn't do any good. Abe remembered the units were soundproofed. The apartment had started going haywire. Sparks flew from the light sockets and plugs. The fridge in the kitchen fell over. Burners came on. Water poured from the faucets. Music and news reports blasted. Um, 
Oh, right, yeah. The Bobby Dots had surged from glass panel to glass panel, a blur of helter-skelter motion that made no sense at all. Their colours pulsed, nearly blinding, their faces contorted. Waves of electric static began to cascade through the apartment. We need to get up to the Gen 1s, Sasha had said urgently. Why? Abe said. Get a grip. Who's been helping you? Abe blinked. Yeah, but what if their version of helping kills us? A flashing blue arc of electricity had shot their way. Sasha and Abe had ducked and scurried out of its path. Can it be any worse than this? Sasha had snapped. She had a point. Okay, Abe said. Both of them had look, looked up at the high ceilings. If you stand on the table, Sasha pointed at the dining table, and I sit on your shoulders, I think I can reach it. Um, the dining table had slid across the floor. Sasha swore. They're standing on the table now, but having it nudged so it doesn't move. They're trying to get to the trapdoor. I can reach it, she said, but it won't budge. Is there a lock? I can't see. There might be a mechanism. I can jimmy. I need a flashlight and something to slide into the crack. The Bobby Dots are able to fling tiny appliances with electric volts for a short period of time. The kitchen had been going crazy around them, but Abe had left Sasha on the table while he dodged flying canned goods and plates to get to the drawer that held the cutlery and miscellany drawer where he kept a small flashlight. So what's their motivation then? Okay. A pot had grazed his head and a skillet had whacked his ear. But Abe had been able to reach the drawers. He grabbed the flashlight first, then he reached for a butcher knife. Suddenly, all the knives in the drawer flung up. He got out just in time. Sasha, duck! Abe had shouted as he hit the floor. The knives had whizzed past above his head. He heard them thunk against the glass panel behind the dining table. The glass didn't break. The knives had clattered to the floor. Um, they are now dodging projectile appliances being flung at them. This is so cool, man. Abe had leaped up and jumped back into the dining room table, and now Sasha was prodding at the trapdoor crack with the butcher knife. Bro had a spatula hit his forehead. Sasha's arm was bleeding from the slap of a cheese grater. For, for reasons Abe didn't understand once the projectiles hit the floor, they stayed there. That was good. If the, lives, if the knives levitated and came at them again, this would be the end. Now they're trying to shock them, using the lights on the ceiling as a port to shock. I think I've, always, I think I've almost got it, Sasha said. Abe hoped he could last that long. His legs were about to give out. His brain was perilously close to fried. To distract himself, Abe tried talking to the Bobby Dots. Why are you doing this? He called out. I thought you were friends. You never share your food. You don't appreciate us. You take us for granted. Sasha yelled. I've got it. Abe heard a snap and a thump. And a thump. The trapdoor swung open. Sasha climbed herself up into the trapdoor. She reached toward him. Grab my hands. You're not strong enough to pull me up. No, but you can climb up my arms, she shouted. That's not really how it works, but okay. I'm strong enough for that. Just grab on and pretend I'm a rope. Abe opened his mouth to argue, but the table started to slide out from under him. Electricity began to gather in a network of slashing blue light along the baseboard in the kitchen. Abe did the best pull-up he would ever done in his life until he'd hoard his upper body into the crawl space. As soon as he went through the doorway... Oh no, he's going to find... He's going to find um, Landon... As soon as he was through the doorway, the Bobby Dot screams reaching in behind him. Uh, the trap door slammed shut. The bottom of the crawl space consisted of drywall attached to metal joists, which were placed 16 inches apart. Abe was pretty sure the drywall wouldn't hold their weight. They'd had, they'd had to balance on the metal joists. Abe tried to shift his weight again, seeking a more comfortable position. Be careful, Sasha whispered. The Before she could say any more, the Gen 1 started wailing. The sound was deafening. Abe sat up. His head ended up uh, a couple inches below the joists above him. Propping his legs on the joists under him, he shifted to face the chilling sound. He stiffened when he looked into the glowing eyes of the three Gen 1s. Two luminous blue orbs, one shining pink orb, and one large blazing green orb was just three feet from Abe. In the dim glow of the small flashlight, Sasha aimed at the Gen 1s. Abe could see one and two's cracked white endoskeletons and two's battered metal endoskeleton. Um, the cables coiled around them like a knot of enmeshed black worms. Oh, yeah. The Gen 1s are, going to cr are trying to cry and wail, but it comes out as a screeching static. They're in pain. Abe watched as the Gen 1s continued to bawl and shudder. His eyes widened when Sha Sasha, perched on two ceiling joists next to Abe, started to scoot closer to the Gen 1s. Don't! Abe cried out. He caught Sasha and pulled her back just in time. Writhing black cables surged out of the darkness and whipped between Sasha and the darkness. The Gen 1 scratchy uh, caterwauls got even louder. Or caterwauls. 
Uh, Sasha is using her social worker skills on robots. Sasha tried to calm the robots. Shh, Sasha said. We know you're trying to help. We know. She's a social worker. She works with children. Parallel. The Bobby Dots are children. <laughs> Probably not. Um, my theories are so bad. <laughs> we know you're trying to help. We know. The broken screeches ended abruptly. Gen 1 slowly calmed. In silence. Three's single pink eye glowed brighter than one's blue eyes and two's green eye brightened. I'm so sorry you've been hurt, Sasha said to the Gen 1's. Can any of you talk? Sasha asked the Gen 1's. A prolonged hiss preceded a choking gurgle. Then Three's mouth creaked as it hinged open. Kill, Three said. We killed, she uttered again. The word came out in several shuttered syllables that sounded like metal clicking on metal. Abe shuddered and tried to pull Sasha back from the Gen 1s. She resisted him. Who did you kill? Sasha asked calmly as if she was discussing the weather. Let me guess. Three continued to speak in distorted words, words wrapped in hisses and gurgles and punctuated by clicks. Her words, however, were clear enough. We killed Landon. Abe's breath caught in his throat. Was Sasha wrong, after all? Why did you kill Landon? Sasha asked. The cables that trailed out of the darkness surged up upward like a black eruption. The Gen 1's eyes glowed brighter, and Three's voice became more clear. Landon was going to burn down the tower. Uh, oh. Is Landon Michael? Is Landon Michael? I feel like Landon could be Michael. <clears throat> um, <laughs> we could not let him do that. It was against the programming. What are you programmed to do? Sasha asked. We are programmed to protect. We're programmed to protect the tenant, to protect the building. The building's protection is at paramount. Therefore, it overrides the need to protect the tenant. Nice. Nice storytelling right there. They had to kill Landon. There was no choice. They didn't want to. Abe was in awe of Sasha. If she wasn't here, Abe was sure he'd been dead by now. He'd have been so panicked and knee-jerk his, in his reactions that he wouldn't have had a snowball's chance in hell of having this conversation. A loud thud sounded from the apartment below. What were the Bobby Dots doing down there? Could their systems reach up here? He decided it was time for him to speak up. Summoning his courage, Abe looked up at Three's glowing eyes. Do you know why the Gen ones? Uh, do you know why the Gen Two Bobby Dots are trying to kill me? In spite of the extensive damage to her vocal processor, Three had a lot to say about the Bobby Dots. The Gen Twos assigned to this unit are experimental. The Gen One, the Gen Twos were programmed differently than we were, and differently than the Gen Twos in the other units in the building. Their programming was intended to give them more confidence and autonomy. Therefore, this programming gave the Gen Twos a sense of superiority. Ah. They now see humans as parasites disrupting the balance of things. This is epic. This is so good. They wish to remove humans so the AI system can be pure and smooth functioning. They will not stop until they reach their goal. But they acted that, that but they acted like they liked me, Abe said. They do. They are fascinated by humans. They love and they hate. They love and they hate. All the same. Abe looked at Sasha. Any idea how we're going to get out of this alive? Sasha looked up at three pulsing pink eye. Do you know how to deactivate the Gen 2s? The tenant can manually initiate a system update, Three said. Remember part one when they said they couldn't? <gasps> nice! That's sick! That's so cool! I was just about to say, like, in part one, in part one they said that they that they couldn't, that, like, there were no updates to do. Abe shook his head. I suggested doing that when you were going to hurt, when I thought they were going to hurt me. Rose said it couldn't be done. Three's cables whipped out, barely missing Abe's knee. She lied. Three hissed. I love this character. For some reason, Rose's lie made the Gen 2's betrayal even more painful to Abe. Abe shook off his silly hurt feelings. Okay, he said. So if I do the update, that will deactivate them? Three's cables quivered around her skull. That only stops their current actions temporarily. After you do the update, you have to cut the power to wipe out the Gen 2's. The switch is the panel on the wall in the office. Okay, so he has to get to the office. Oh, she finished. 
Abe thought of the distance between the trapdoor and the office. He was about to ask how to do that without being electrocuted or crushed, but then a metallic crack stopped him. Abe turned to look behind him just in time to see a pipe running along the outside wall of the crawl space burst open. Water began spewing from it like a geyser, uh, yeah, geyser creating a rushing current that coursed through the crawl space. The Jam Ones began to scream. Their exposed wires began to scramble as they cr tried to crawl towards Sasha and Abe. Abe began to shrink back, but Sasha stopped him, reminding him that they were there to help. The water begins to slush in more. The drywall is starting to crack. That drywall isn't going to ho hold the water up, Abe said. The drywall is beginning to sink in. Even if the drywall didn't cave in, how would they hang onto the joists without drowning? Suddenly the Jam Ones vanished, because the drywall caved in. The entire ceiling of the apartment, the floor of the crawl space, collapsed into the apartment below. The Gen 1s fall, fell down into the apartment as well, they're hurt. Oh my gosh. Uh, they landed on a couch peculiarly. Uh, don't forget about the Gen 2s. Sasha pointed at the bottom of the apartment walls. Undulating spikes of blue were skimming along the surface of the water pooling on the floor. The flooding apartment was now electrified. The sound of the Gen 1's screams grabbed Sasha's attention. She turned toward them. They both uh, faced toward the Gen 1's. They were caught in the electrical currents, writhing as if in agony. Nice. Agony reference. Agony jump scare. Their limbs windmilling, their cables flapping. Sasha stared at the Gen 1's agony and horror. We need to get higher, Abe said. We need to get on top of our partition. Her, he's helping Sasha lift up over a partition in front of the partition of the wall where is a screen where Gemini is just smiling at them. They both got up on the partition, moving over each partition, began to slip. They had to move fast. If they fell in the water, they would die. They're now trying to get to the control panel to set up a system update and turn the power off. But they're avoiding the walls, swaying motions, trying to avoid the shocking water below them. The water continued to rise and electri electricity began to spark. The Gem 1's agony went on. He's initializing an update. Look, Sasha said. Um, Abe turned. He clutched the remains of an enclosure and watched as the Gen 2's images began to deconstruct. Their bodies came apart and they joined together again in topsy-turvy ways. Feet came out of the tops of their heads. Their pigtails streamed from their bellies. Their hands jutted out from their eyes. They began spewing words, but none of them made sense together. The Gen 2 systems were crashing, but they were still just as active as before. They needed to turn the power off. The Gen 1s are still active, but they are starting to ride them more, getting weaker. Abe looked at the last partition. He needed to reach the office. He braced himself and began to leap. Before he could, the dining room table, caught in the sparkling and swirling water, shifted violently. It slammed into the partition. The partition went over like a felled tree, slapping the water and sending sparks flying. Abe was caught onto the partition, barely hanging on. Um, oh no, Sasha called out. Abe understood her despair. There was no way he could get to the office now. He couldn't jump far enough to get to the next partition. Abe began to think to himself. Had all this struggle be been for nothing? As if confirming their impending doom, the partition he was balanced on canted sharply. Abe's gaze locked on the s w waiting electrified water as he fell. It was going to be the last thing he could ever see. But suddenly the water seethed. The Gen 1s burst up through the roiling waves, electricity still cracking over their metal skeletons. The Gen 1s en masse extended their cables outward. Their cables are now bunched together, extending above every room in the apartment. Wow. Within seconds, the end of each cable was linked to an electronic connection. Cables plugged into wall sockets and computer terminals. They crisscrossed the entire apartment like electrical grid work. A defining pop filled the apartment. Shiny trails of electrical current crawled up the walls and spiralled across the ceiling. The Gen 1s let out resounding squalls that vibrated all the way through Abe's body. Then they were silent. The Gen 1s went limp and sank beneath the water's surface. The glass panels darkened. Abe and Sasha began to slide down the remaining partition. This is very long-winded. I'm sorry. It is, I think. Um, they landed thigh-deep in the water, and they didn't die. The Gen 1s overrode the apartment circuits to kill the Gen 2s. Sasha sloshed over to Three, who lay on her back under the water. Her one eye was dark. Suddenly, the phone on the kitchen wall began ringing. Exchanging a glance with Sasha, Abe waded toward the phone reluctantly. He picked up the phone. An automated voice spoke on the other line. Maintenance. We have a flood warning for your unit. Abe thought, duh. The automated uh, voice continued. We'll send someone up in a bit for cleanup. Time skipped to a couple of days later. Um, 
Elvis Presley came to the door. He's in an elevator discussing Saturday's previous game, just casual things. It would appear this is a long time after the catastrophe. We'll see where it's headed. Here's the thing. The Fazplex Towers administration overlooked Abe's forced tenancy, as they were happy his unauthorised access had, had resulted in solving the Bobby Dots issues. Very nice. He has now been granted access to the apartment, and they are offering him a remodel of the place. They were trying to find a way to get rid of the Bobby Dots for a while, it seems, but left it unoccupied as it was too dangerous, hence the lack of tenancy. Sasha was at the end of the hall when he exited the elevator. She was carrying groceries. She had decided after the event of the confrontation with the Gen 2s, they were better staying together. They felt close to each other. Both Sasha and Abe... Um, both Sasha and Abe opened the door to their newly redecorated and colourful apartment space. So the Gen 1s, right? They were able to be salvaged, and now they are being repaired by Sasha and Abe in an attempt to see if they can get them online again. Eventually, they began to get the Gen 1s online. They also managed to reactivate 3's vocal processor. 3 was able to explain to them that they were grateful, despite all the chaos and violence they endured. This is so lovely. I love this ending. Um, Sasha decided the Gen 1s needed names. I'm sorry for what's about to happen. Sasha and Abe decided to name the Gen 1s after Queens. Oh. My. God. One was Elizabeth. Two was Isabella. Three was Victoria. Elizabeth Afton. Isabella from Dance With Me? No, surely not, right? Was there another Isabella? There was an Isabella in Dance With Me. That's the, um... That is a girl who is connected to Ballora. And three was Victoria. Victoria from Help Wanted. What? <laughs> um... Surely that can't be important. Surely it's just a coincidence. I I don't know about that. Like, we know that Victoria is a robot. We know that Elizabeth technically is a robot with, like, baby. Maybe Charlie bots. But Isabella as well? I don't know. Was, is Isabella even a queen? Queen Isabella? I've never heard of Queen Isabella. Should have called it Mary. <laughs> Mary from 1.35am, the singing old lady next to Delilah's room. <laughs> Over time, they found new eyes, legs, and arms for the three of them until they could properly function again. Using enough plastic pieces, he was able to piece together an entirely new exoskeleton for Isabel. Or Isabella. Uh, they're fixed, and it turns out his mother is going to move in soon from the care facility, and the Gen 1s will be able to take care of her now. Oh my god, she is real. <laughs> I think they're going to love taking care of your mum, Sasha told Abe. He thought of the last three months and how crazy they'd been. He'd gone from living in complete isolation to experiencing her near death. And now he was experiencing the life of his dreams. Abe looked over at the gem ones on the wall. He smiled. I think she's going to love them too. I just got the chills. Apparently the Gen 2s were confined to a holographic space, as in their very holographic being was made of electricity. They were sentient enough to will their energy and redirect it into the rest of the apartment to spark electricity. Makes sense. Makes sense. <sighs> Best story in the franchise. 100%. I'm giving it to Bobby Dots. Bobby Dots 1 and 2. Uh, I don't think either one is, like, good by itself. But, uh, no, not good by itself. I mean, the best by itself. But together makes the perfect story. There's nothing wrong with this story. There is genuinely nothing wrong with this story. It's got little lore bits. It is very cinematic. It's got a massive twist. The characters are adorable. The scenes are all adorable. It ends with a really, really happy ending. The first part ends with a little bit of a cliffhanger. There's so much comedy in it. So many emotional parts. So many scary parts, like I was genuinely terrified with the uh, Gen 1s earlier and then the Gen 2s like with pigtails coming out of their bodies and like arms coming out of their head, like even trying to imagine that it's pretty, pretty horrifying. Wow. That, that is the story of all time. <laughs> that is the story of all time. I'm baffled. 
Let me know what you think in the comments. Um, I'm sorry that most of my theories were wrong in the end. <laughs> this is very interesting to me. One was Elizabeth, two was Isabella, three was Victoria. They didn't have to put that in the story. Like they they could have just left left it like they didn't have names. But the fact that they did put that like when I saw one was Elizabeth, I was thinking, no, please don't call the second one Mike and the third one like Evan or something. Uh but I don't know. I don't know if this is something or not. But they surely they wouldn't put that detail in if it wasn't for like a reference. It is weird though because Victoria is a robot. Okay. Does she like food? Dunno. I don't know. I I it's amazing. Great story. Ten out of ten. Clap clap clap. Bravo Cawthon. That is the motto of this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I love you. Uh, hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you later. Goodbye.